Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for our final woman in the Aviation Advisory Board meeting. We are coming to you on Zoom and on the FAA's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter live streams. For any reporters joining us on the live stream, please note that all discussions are for background only. A video archive of the event will be available on the FAA's social media accounts after the meeting ends. Now, recognizing the importance of this advisory board, the FAA Administrator Steve Dixon would like to take this opportunity to provide welcoming remarks. Thank you, Administrator Dixon, for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Angela, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Wilson and uh, esteemed members of the uh, Women in Aviation Advisory Board, I, I want to commend your work over the past. Uh, 19 plus months, uh, particularly, uh, I think, the overcoming the challenges that uh, we have had uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I think the only regret I have this morning is not being able to join all of you in person. But uh, I, that doesn't diminish uh, in any way. In fact, it probably makes even more impressive uh, to recognize the steps that you have taken uh, to ensure that girls and women uh, can enjoy the opportunities uh, that are before us uh, to join all of us in the aerospace industry. Uh, your, your work is, is, is tremendously valuable in that respect. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Heather Wilson for her leadership and stewardship uh, of the board uh, during this time. You know, the number of women in aerospace and aviation is steadily growing. And I do I firmly believe that uh, this really is in many ways, the most exciting time that we've seen in aerospace in generations. And there are many more pathways uh, than there were 25, 30, 40 years ago uh, into our business. And so we hope uh, that uh, the work that we're doing together uh, will help to enable more women to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. For its part, the FAA has taken numerous actions uh, over the last few years to create a more diverse, more inclusive workforce within the agency and also uh, promoting the same within the aviation and aerospace communities. For example, we have tripled over the last three years the complement of interns from our, uh, minority service, uh, our minority serving institutions program. And for the first time, we're also looking at uh, direct hire authority for these bright young people who are interested in aerospace careers and might be interested in starting that career uh, within the agency. We've also uh, began a program to adopt gender neutral and inclusive language. Now this, uh, this takes some time. Uh, there are some terms like airman and unmanned that are part of our lexicon uh, and we are changing uh, that. Uh, for example, since 1947, uh, NOTAMS has stood for Notices to Airmen. Well, a few months ago, we actually uh, changed that to Notices to Air Missions, and we're using that as part of our daily, uh, our, our daily nomenclature these days. We also continue to make uh, career and education outreach a very high priority. Uh, our STEM AVSED program uh, within our regions is very strong and continues to, uh, to do great things. We're reaching out to young women and girls from all walks of life to encourage them to look at exciting things that are happening in aerospace and aviation, uh, like advanced air mobility, drones, certainly commercial space operations, and even supersonic transport. Now, we also know that we have to meet people where they are. And uh, I know that over the last couple of years, I've been on social media a lot more uh, than I had, had thought I would. Uh, and this is one of the things that I think the pandemic actually accelerated a trend that was already there. And uh, we've been able to broaden our outreach and really, I think, do a much more effective job of not just posting the FA logo on a website. Uh, we're actually meeting, uh, meeting people uh, who are interested in aviation aerospace careers more in ways that are accessible to them. Um, and we've also, uh, in doing this, been able to leverage the reach 
of social media influencers, several of which I've had the opportunity to work with over the past couple of years. And this has really multiplied uh, the impact of the outreach uh, that we have all uh, undertaken here over the last couple of years. This month, we highlighted some of the FAA's trailblazing executives through our Women's History Month events, events attended by astronauts, fighter pilots, and girls aspiring to be aviators. And more broadly, uh, I also had the opportunity to participate in a fireside chat a couple of weeks ago with four very accomplished women in our Air Force, and this was the members of the uh, F-35 demonstration team. Now, I've said many times that a diverse workforce uh, is best equipped for the job of ensuring the safety of an increasing, increasingly complex aerospace world. As the premier aviation safety authority in the world, the last thing that we at FAA can afford is groupthink. Diversity makes us stronger, it brings new perspectives, increased innovation, and frankly, uh, better, makes, uh, makes for better decisions as well. Now, women are essential to the continued safety, innovation, and success of this industry. And I'm eager to see your recommendations, and I'm very confident that they will go a long way to help us work together to bring more women into the aerospace workforce. So I wanna thank you all again for your hard work. Uh, wish everyone well. And now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Deputy Secretary Polly Trottenberg. Thanks, thanks so much, Steve. Um, and first of all, uh, as a lot of you know, sadly, Steve's time as our FAA administrator is drawing to a close. And I just wanna to say to this group, um, how much we appreciate his incredible service and leadership. And, and thanks, Steve, for your comments. We know you are someone who is thinking deeply about how to continue to diversify the aviation field. Um, and so thanks so much for having me here. And I'm bringing greetings from Secretary Buttigieg and you know, looking at this amazing panel of women on the screen. And really, I wanna, first of all, thank all of you for your service over these long months, especially Dr. Wilson. Um, so appreciate your leadership. And, and Steve, I just wanna acknowledge um, coming back to US DOT and remembering what NOTAMS stands for and, and seeing we finally found a way to, to, to make it gender neutral, thank you. Um, I just wanna take a minute, first of all, to acknowledge uh, at DOT, I think as you all know, some of the amazing women we do have at the FAA. Shanetta Griffin, who's our Associate Administrator for Airports. Terry Bristol, sadly retiring, but our chief, she was our Chief Operating Officer for the Air Traffic Organization. Jeff Sipniski, Steve's Chief of Staff, and before her, um, Angela, uh, Angela McCullough now, who's our acting ATO Deputy Chief Operating Officer, Ginny Boyle, Michelle Merkel, a whole list of incredible women. So we have some extraordinary leadership at the FAA. But I think we also know at the FAA and at DOT writ large, um, we still have a long way to go in terms of getting more women into the field. Uh, and that's something I know Steve has been committed to, I'm committed to, as has Secretary Buttigieg. And so I am truly excited to see um, you know, the incredible ideas this panel um, is gonna come up with. Uh, it is exciting to hear about your work. And, you know, we are so looking forward to an aviation industry in which, you know, women are prominent leaders and, you know, represent the diversity uh, throughout all the ranks of the industry. So Steve, again, thanks for your leadership, Dr. Wilson and, and everyone on this screen. Thank you all and, and really look forward to the discussion today. Thank you so much, Deputy Secretary, for taking the time out of your schedule to be with us today. We really appreciate it. So now what I would do is read the Federal Advisory Committee Act official statement. This meeting is been held pursuant to a notice published in the Federal Register on March the 2nd, 2022. The agenda for the meeting was announced in that notice with details as set out in the agenda posted on the FAA's committee website. I am the designated federal officer responsible for compliance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act under which the meeting is conducted. It is my responsibility to see to it that the agenda is adhered to and that accurate minutes are kept. I also have the responsibility to adjourn the meeting should I find it necessary to do so in the public interest. Only women in aviation advisory board members may participate in any discussions and vote on matters put to a vote by the chair. Now I would turn it over to our chair, Heather Wilson. Thank you, Angela. This report is timely. 
We're coming out of a global pandemic during which thousands were laid off or took early retirement in the airline industry. Just last week, two carriers announced that 65,000 flights would be canceled over the next few months, in part because of a lack of trained people. Yet since the dawn of, the, of aviation itself, the industry has drawn its employees largely from only half of the potentially qualified population. Recent decades have seen changes for women. We're the majority of lawyers and doctors now, majority of people graduating from college, the majority of people who start small businesses and journalists and professors. A lot of things have changed, but aviation has largely not changed. And it's hurting the industry and the public that it serves. So Congress asked this committee to come together and to, to dive deep on why and how we can change that. Over the last almost two years, this group of 30 women from across the country with collectively hundreds of years of experience in aviation and the aviation industry, pilots and academics and mechanics and airport managers and safety experts and executives with nonprofits have come together to dive deeply on why. What is our reality? What is it women face in the industry and the associated parts of this industry? and then to come up with recommendations for change. This has been a collective effort, and I wanted to thank all 30 members of this committee for all of your work, uh, particularly during a difficult uh, global pandemic. I particularly wanted to thank the writing team who over the last three months have pulled together the disparate ideas of a lot of really brilliant people and put it into a coherent and understandable report that we can submit to the FAA and the Congress. I look forward to the discussion today and to the presentation of those ideas. And with that, I would like to ask, we have in our, uh, we have in our uh, package the approval, the minutes of the meeting of the 1st of December, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? A motion move to, to approve. approve the minutes. Lindsay moves to approve. Marianne, would you second? Second. Seconded by Marianne. All those in favor, please raise your hand so we can see you. Any opposed? The minutes are approved. So what I'd like to shift to now is actually the recommendations report um, and a summary of the work that we've done uh, and, uh, and the a summary of the content of the report. We're going to do this with a PowerPoint presentation with different members of the committee briefing on different slides. Um, and, uh, and I think that's the, that's the best way to both demonstrate, uh, to leverage the wonderful experience we have on this committee. Um, and, uh, and for many of those who are deeply involved in these recommendations to explain them um, to, uh, to, uh, to the public and also to, to uh, other members of the committee. And with that, what I would do is uh, the title of our report is Breaking Barriers for Women in Aviation, a Flight Plan for the Future. This is the time to make some changes. It's, in, indeed, it's long past time. And with that, I would turn it over to, to uh, Beth Wilson to start out with talking about our vision statement. Next slide, please. Uh, our vision statement is uh, the Women in Aviation Advisory Board seeks to leave to future generations an industry that has attracted and retained the best possible talent. The result will be an industry on the leading edge of safety, innovation, and profitability. Purposeful attention to workplace culture, recruitment, retention, and advancement of women will improve access to all those seeking opportunity for satisfying careers. Our vision statement, along with the recommendations, create a pathway to achieve an industry that will best and safely serve everyone from the cockpit to the tarmac to the main cabin. And with that, I'm going to let us move on uh, and I will pass it over to my colleague, Kate. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Beth. Um, 
who are the women of this uh, of the advisory board? The uh, the advisory board, we were appointed to the board in May of 2020, and the women come from diverse backgrounds representing both industry and academic leaders within aviation, all of which bring a specific perspective and expertise to this board. The board is fortunate to be led by Dr. Heather Wilson, former secretary of the Air Force and currently president of the University of Texas at El Paso. We couldn't have um, asked for a better leader than Dr. Wilson. The board itself includes women leaders from the aviation industry, including major airlines and aerospace companies, nonprofit organizations with industry, within the industry, like the National Air and Space Museum, the National Aviation Hall of Fame, and the Mid-Atlantic Aerospace Complex, aviation business associations, such as NATCA, the National Business Aircraft Association, and the Airline Pilots Association, engineering business organizations, and airport leaders, as Heather mentioned. We're also very fortunate to have representatives from the United States Air Force Auxiliary, Civil Air Patrol, and four institutions of higher education and aviation trade schools. One thing that all of us have in common is that all, all the members of this advisory board are fully committed to increasing the number of women in this great industry, not just as a job, but as a career. And with that, I'll hand off to my colleague, Pam Wilson. Thank you, Kate, and good morning, everyone. So aviation encompasses the design, development, production, operation, and use of aircraft. These operations include, but are not limited to, military aviation, commercial aviation, including passenger and cargo airlines, government contractors, and general aviation, such as flight training, business travel, aerial firefighting, crop dusting, pipeline patrol, air ambulance services, search and rescue, and recreational flying. It also includes space, uncrewed aircraft systems, UAS, or drones, and emerging, emerging technologies, including electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, EVATOLs, often discussed in the context of air taxis. Aviation connects people and places around the world in ways that no other industry can. The U.S. aviation industry is the safest, largest, most varied, and most technologically innovative transportation industry in the world. 45,000 flights and 2.9 million passengers fly in and out of U.S. airports every day. Aviation makes up 5.2% of the U.S. GDP and generates about 11 million jobs. Why we matter is because attracting, retaining, and advancing women in aviation is critical to the U.S. aviation industry's safety, sustainability, profitability, and ability to innovate. Essentially, any skill or area of interest can find a home in the aviation industry. I will now turn it over to Lauren, who will discuss our history, reality, and the vision. Thank you, Pam. And on the occasion of this final meeting, before I jump into the structure of the report, I, I just want to say what an honor and a privilege it has been to work with this incredible group of people and on an issue that is so incredibly important, as, as Pam just powerfully explained. I'll provide a very high level overview of our final report, a product that we're very proud and excited to share. The final report is 70 plus pages of information, including some of the figures and tables that you'll see today and recommendations. Uh, it also includes impactful pictures of women in aviation jobs and quotes from professionals. It's been a long flight to today. Um, for those of you who joined us throughout the development of our recommendations and the drafting of our final report, you may remember that early on, we created four subcommittees to address the duties tasked to us in our charter. Those sub subcommittees focused on first, understanding the problem, uh, developing a strong picture of the gender gap data, industry trends, the factors and barriers that encourage or discourage women, either directly or indirectly from pursuing aviation. Second, training and recruiting, the avenues for recruiting and training young women to consider aviation through engagement and education. Third, mentoring and professional development. 
focused on creating exposure and mentorship opportunities, including ongoing and long-term engagement, and fourth, uh, success stories focused on identifying and celebrating the achievements of individuals, entities, and organizations that have succeeded in encouraging women and girls to join aviation. Uh, these subcommittees used original research, uh, existing research, literature reviews, interviews, individual personal experiences to inform an understanding of the present circumstances, how we got that to them, and the course forward. And the combination of that work led us to structure a report around three principles, our history, our reality, and our vision. Our history provides an essential context for both our call to action and the course forward that we chart through the report. It very briefly examines the breadth and scope of opportunities in aviation and aerospace, as uh, Pam just explained, and, and the importance of the industry, the impact on our transportation infra infrastructure and our economy. It also highlights the legacy of women who inspired this report and not only shaped aviation heritage, but elevated the course of humanity. And uh, unfortunately, also underscores the lack of progress that has been made, which is examined in great depth in our gender gap data analyzed in the our reality section, which uh, Kelly and Becky will discuss further in a moment. In addition to striking numbers on the underrepresentation of women in, in our industry and our reality, our reality also explains that the status quo is not without cost, but rather threatens to compromise aviation's excellence, impacting our sustainability, our profitability, our ability to innovate, and most importantly, our safety. Finally, our reality also explores what factors bring women into and deter women from pursuing aviation. Our report culminates with our vision and the recommendations that can bring about the future of aviation, an industry that has retracted and retained this best talent through improved access for all. Our board applied a systems redesign approach to change founded in the barriers timeline model that you've seen in earlier meetings and we'll discuss further today. This model depicts the system of barriers for women in aviation, also the opportunities for interven intervention. For our organization, we categorized our recommendations as culture, recruitment, retention, advancement, and data. But these are soft categories. Culture underlies most, and the impact of many extend beyond the specific category, as we'll explain further. Each recommendation begins with an assignee an entity or entities that we are calling on to implement and a title and a description. Um, but fundamentally, our recommendations are based on a thorough analysis and understanding of the problem, the system that is explored and explained in the our history and our reality. And Kelly will now introduce a more detailed look at this reality. Thank you, Lauren. So as was mentioned, one of the first things the board wanted to do was have a true understanding and identification of the problem. We had a separate subcommittee to identify those problems and come up with information to share with everyone on the, on the, on the board. We wanted to know where we are at in 2022, how did we get here, how much has changed over the years with women in, in the aviation workforce. We wanted to know why women get into aviation, and when they were first exposed to aviation or what created that spark of interest. We wanted to know what keeps them in the industry and what drives them to leave. We analyzed data reports, interviews, research, all of this that had already been done by others, but then as Lauren mentioned, we did our own research as well. Talked to a lot of different people in the industry, learned where there may be gaps in the data and ultimately came up with some recommendations on gathering additional data that's needed. So I'm starting with a very high level overview of what we found. Becky Ludi is gonna get into more of the details on some of the statistics and the data. But in, in most aviation occupations, women make up less than 20% of the workforce. One example of an exception to that is flight attendants, but most other careers in aviation are at less than 20%. With aviation facing workforce challenges and talent shortages in many areas, it makes sense to tap into this opportunity to bring more women into the industry. 
again, Becky is our, our data guru, so she's going to get into more details and more numbers. But for the last 60 years, the introduction of women into aviation has been fairly stagnant. You'll see the lines. They're pretty flat. It's just not getting much better over decades of time. We've seen minuscule increases over time in the percentage of the workforce that are women, and that needs to change. When we start to look at statistics for women who belong to an additional underrepresented group, such as women of color, we found that those groups face additional and unique barriers that need to be considered and addressed as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Becky and she'll continue the discussion about our reality and getting into some of the specific numbers. Thanks, Kelly. Let's take a deeper look at those numbers that Kelly was just talking about, um, because it's really important that we understand where we're at uh, in terms of the numbers of women in aviation. And also to note that what gets measured gets done. So as we look at these areas in these next few slides, I want you to think about three particular areas of concern. One is the lack of women in aviation. Two is the lack of growth historically in the numbers of women in aviation. And three is the lack of data. I also do wanna point out that we do have uh, much more data in the full report, but you will see a snapshot of some of the key areas today in this briefing. So let's start with this one. We've got this representation again, of uh, women's percentage in several aviation occupation areas uh, in our field, starting with uh, in the middle there, the 11% to 20%. So women make up between 11 and 20% of the workforce in those occupation areas that are listed, including aerospace engineers, aviation higher ed faculty, airport managers, ATC, and dispatch. But the greatest areas of gender gap continue to be those at the top of the list there women in senior leadership positions, women airline pilots at 5%, and the greatest gender gap, women maintenance technicians at just shy of 3%. But I also, as you look at this, I also want you to think about what's missing. We have quite a few occupation areas here, but this certainly doesn't encompass everything we do in aviation. And we need better data on a broader array of occupation areas. Next slide, please. As noted, we also have not had significant growth historically. So this is a look at um, data on women FAA certificate holders. And if you look from the last 60 years up to 2020, we see some relatively inconsequential growth. Now I'll say the total numbers are good, right? When you look at the raw numbers, we do see an increase and that's positive and we'll take it. <laughs> we enjoy that when we see it. And as Administrator Dixon just said earlier, there is great opportunities right now for women in aviation um, and the opportunity for growth. But look, for example, at the number of ATPs, 1960, 25 women ATPs, and now we're at over 7,500. So that's a positive trend in the right direction, and that's good. However, when you consider it in terms of representation, the percentage of women in these areas, we really see pretty inconsequential growth. So for example, commercial pilots have grown at only a rate of about 1% a decade for women. And mechanics are less than half of that. Next slide, please. And then if you drill down and look at um, an analysis over 15 years. So we look at about the last 15 years, this represents 2005 to 2020 and the percentage of women in a variety of occupational areas. And I mean, it doesn't take much. I mean, just look at this graph. It's a flat line effect. We're not seeing, again, an incredible amount of growth. And so if you look at this uh, graph from the bottom to the top, again, mechanics, the greatest area or the greatest gender gap in our industry, that's the bottom line. And then moving up, you see ATPs, flight instructor, commercial pilots, the gray line is private pilots, and the very top are air traffic controllers. And in some of these areas, over this 15 year time frame, we see less than 1% of growth. Next slide. In addition, we acknowledge that much of the aviation workforce also lacks racial and ethnic diversity. As you can see from the occupation areas listed on this slide, for example, if you look at pilots on the top line, they are noted as 94% white. I wanna point out again though, 
what's not here. We don't have this data broken down by gender. And that's important because we know that women who also belong to additional underrepresented groups face unique challenges and barriers. And again, when it comes to data, if we're not even measuring it, we're not serious about addressing it. So we need to do a better job. So in summary, I would just say again, um, the three key areas that we see from the gender gap data and what our reality is, is that women are significantly underrepresented. We haven't seen significant growth historically and we need better data. Our report will provide recommendations to change that flatline effect. They will also address the data needs and allow the industry to gain the benefits that Administrator Dixon just spoke of. And I wanna close by saying, this is more than just numbers. The numbers represent the experiences of women who are one of 3% or one of 5%, who day to day throughout their career are one of only a few or sometimes the only. And to better understand that experience, you're gonna next hear from my colleague, Lindsay, Lindsay Dryling on workplace culture. Thank you, Dr. Ludi. Um, just as she was saying, as we start to dive into what does those experiences look like for women, and as Lauren and Kelly mentioned, to really understand this current reality, we as the board dove into current research that had been conducted, and then also ourselves had reached out to women in the industry to assist in understanding the situation and to identify why, why there continues to be this large gender gap in aviation professions. What we found was culture was and is a barrier throughout each stage of the journey for women in aviation. Just an example, in a study for aviation culture, glass sky for women pilots, they found the primary deterrent to the recruitment, retention, and advancement for women in aviation is a negative workplace culture. Additionally, uh, surveys conducted by Dr. Ludi showed that women working in the aviation industry were asked open-ended questions about what they considered their greatest challenge and barrier that they experienced in their careers. And again, the most common response related to a negative workplace culture. So some may ask, what does this mean? What is this negative workplace culture? How can we understand that? And as we dove in, we've really found that some studies identified these negative experiences for women, ranging anywhere from being overlooked for opportunities, um, not being provided, um, stretch opportunities, being interpreted um, and having ideas dismissed or maybe misattributed to someone else, being viewed as overly aggressive or being subjected to non-inclusive norms. Furthermore, in Iowa's IAWA's Soaring Through the Glass Ceiling study, they found that two thirds of women surveyed felt that they had been treated differently because of their gender. And 40% felt that their voices had not been heard in the industry. Over and over again, as we dove into these studies and conducted these studies and surveys of women in aviation, they all pointed towards challenges with the workplace culture. This included um, implicit gender discrimination and bias and also sexual harassment issues. Aviation's culture must be more inclusive to really create that sense of belonging for women. This fundamental point, as Lauren had pointed out, runs throughout our report and throughout our recommendations, which you'll hear shortly. We do realize that changing culture is a complex and challenging issue that requires us as an industry to change how we act and behave ourselves and also requires leadership from the top levels to the lowest levels. We must create the change that we want to see rather than accepting what it is now. We cannot continue this flatline effect as we move forward. Now I'll hand it over to Dr. Dixon for a more current um, reality and recruitment on recruitment and retention of women in aviation. Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Lindsay. Factors that negatively impact the recruitment and retention of women in aviation include economic factors, including cost of entry, particularly for flight training, family and work balance challenges, the need for additional outreach about career options and pathways, lack of women in leadership positions, need for leadership commitment to diversity and inclusion, 
and navigating the workplace culture, including gender bias and sexual harassment, are just a few of the barriers that we discovered in our research. Now let's start with a few recruitment barriers specifically. Early exposure to aviation positively influences decisions to pursue aviation careers. A survey of professional women not working in aviation found that 70% of respondents had never considered working in aviation. The most common reason for not considering an aviation career was a lack of familiarity with the options available, available to them. Also, the common misconceptions and incorrect belief that aviation careers require science, technology, engineering, or math is deterring women from pursuing careers in aviation. As for training, most of the work in aviation requires specialized skills that must be acquired through rigorous training. Pilot training is very expensive and in most cases has to be funded by the student. Hence, a lack of funding for flight training is an additional barrier preventing women from choosing a career as a pilot. So what's needed? Federal grant funding for collegiate aviation programs, scholarships, and direct corporate sponsorships are needed to offset the costs and make training affordable. The lack of role models, people who look like me, and social support are among the main obstacles encountered by women during flight training, which often results in lack of completion. Reluctance to seriously consider women candidates during the hiring process is another barrier that was communicated to us. There is a perception that there is a preference for male recruits in many jobs. Women also harbor doubts that they do not meet the physical requirements to operate or maintain an aircraft or inability to meet a busy schedule or fit into a intense aviation work environment. Though young girls may have been exposed to the industry in their family or local community, or may have received career advice at school, they are often not encouraged or are even discouraged from making aviation a career choice based on mistaken assumptions that many of the jobs involved are not for women or because the preconceptions that girls would not be interested in such jobs. So in summary, some of the keys to recruitment barriers um, is making aviation training affordable is one. Also ensuring an easy transition from college to the aviation workforce, overcoming negative perception of aviation related jobs, especially perceptions of physical limitations. As for retention barriers, many issues contribute to the poor retention rate of women in aviation including wage disparities and unequal access to premium wage rates, sexual discrimination and sexual harassment, hazardous work conditions, insufficient attention to health and well being, and limited training opportunities. Pilots and cabin crews are often required to spend much time away from home, which can be more difficult for women who often undertake an unequal share of unpaid family care work and have other domestic commitments. A barrier for women in this situation may, for example, be a lack of flexibility in taking time off or choosing leave days. Initial experience during the early employment period is critical and in an environment that is perceived hostile to women is likely to drive them away from an occupation or industry. The long-term retention of women depends on how they are treated by their employers and coworkers. Additionally, women often have to interrupt their work when they have care responsibilities at home and when those care responsibilities increase. These temporary interruptions may change their career path or even curtail a career in aviation. Family responsibilities, which are often unequal, distri unequally distributed between women and men often undermine women's careers. Male counterparts can also play a role in, in uh, overcoming these barriers by pushing for equity in the workplace. 
Steps must be taken in the development and implementation of training initiatives and programs that include and benefit from the views of women workers as a means of achieving a better gender balance in training. So in summary, the key to retention, improving work conditions, working schedule, work-life balance, professional development, retraining, safety at work, social acceptance, and ensuring advancement opportunities after an interruption due to maternity or other family care responsibilities. At this time, I will turn it over to Bobby Wells to continue. Thanks, Dr. Dixon. Before we go on to the next slide, let me just foundationally, if you'll back up again, um, I wanna talk, the, the, everybody who's preceded me has helped to establish the elements that were so crucial for us to understand what our way forward is. And a favorite quote that the board has used over and over again is that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. We know that culture is a form of system. If we want to change the culture of aviation and aerospace, then we have to be able to address the elements of that culture. As a reminder to the board and the audience, culture is comprised of two categories. The first is artifacts, and those are externally represented, uh, representative of that culture, things such as uniform, language, policies, ceremonies, and that sort of thing. So those are observable by people both inside of the culture and outside of the culture. The other category that, that makes up culture are aspects and those aspects are internal. So those are things that are reflected of, of the values, the behavior and beliefs of the people who participate in that culture. Now, what we know about culture is that we can talk about something being in incredibly important and taking action to address those issues associated with that culture. But if, our, if what we say and what we do do not match up, 100% of the time people will pay attention to what we do because that's visible to people inside and outside of the culture. Back to what Administrator Dixon said is so critically important in the steps that the FAA have taken to change the language that is used in aviation making it more welcome for women who are not considered or wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as airmen, for instance, which he mentioned. Next slide, please. So the barriers timeline model that we'll show in just a second is an, an attempt to systems redesign for our, our board and making recommendations. As everyone has said previously, we had to understand what the issues were in order for us to describe what the pathway forward will be in order to make changes. So this complex system of barriers that exists both from, or all the way from, and you'll see in the model from the very earliest ages all the way to retirement, isn't, isn't just an issue of barriers that are erected one after the other in experience, but it really becomes a web of barriers. So they're interconnected, and they become, they, uh, they have layers associated with them that we'll talk about some more. Aviation, because as Administrator Dixon said, was populated by men, it was a system designed for men. Now this doesn't mean that the system was designed to exclude women. However, because of that system design, what it said to women was, come on into aviation, but you have to find a way to fit in rather than you're welcome, you're valued, we need you. Those are all elements we must change. Understanding the problem and then understanding the opportunities in order to intervene with those barriers are foundational to the board's recommendations. We'll show next the barriers timeline model, which indicates where, how, and when women encountered those barriers, girls and women. Now, as a reminder, those barriers are elements of our culture. So it's important that we don't dismiss them. It's important that we understand who's responsible to change them because the downstream effect is so incredibly negative as everyone has already mentioned. So if we wanna change the result of the system design, we have to change elements of the system. At the, after I talk about the barriers model, I'll hand off to Crystal, who will discuss the opportunities 
for breaking down those barriers and intervening for the future. Next slide. Our work and research provided insight to how and where those barriers occur. So this didn't just come from members of the board, this actually came out of the studies, the papers that were published that we spent a great deal of time reviewing. So let me orient you to the model. Each layer, each horizontal layer represents either a time period, zero to age 10, for instance, and age 11 to 18, or a period in the life experience of a woman who's negotiating an aviation career. This is intended to be a comprehensive list of barriers that we think are most significant in the industry. However, it's not exhaustive. So we can address all these barriers and there'll be other barriers that we'll, we'll need to continue to address. We believe that the barriers are located where they are because they're largely representative of the experiences in that phase. But it doesn't mean that every woman who negotiates that, that part of her life will experience those barriers. It's just generally speaking, that's where the barriers tend to occur. And as I mentioned, the timeline model is intended to depict the experience of barriers from toddler to retirement. Starting with the lowest level, zero to age 10, for example, the lack of role models and the lack of adult influence at, at all the way up to age 18, meaning parents, teachers, other people who might influence young girls to seek aviation careers, can lead to a challenge of, uh, behind the compounding barrier of gender stereotyping. And that becomes extended through life. So while that's something that was is first experienced at a very, very young age, it continues through every successive level of experience. In particular, at the youngest age, ages, there's a lack of ro female role models depicted in aviation in toys and cartoons, in advertisements, or in any sort of media that children are exposed to. So girls don't see the representation of a successful either girl or woman serving in an aviation career so they can begin to see themselves possibly in that role in the future. Under the um, workforce entry level, a possible lack of leadership commitment can lead to poor hiring practices, poor training practices in an organization. Every study we examined found that women cited as the two most important elements of whether they believed what they contributed in their organization or whether they would be successful in the future were associated with one of two things. And they were in reverse order, just depending on the study. The first is senior executive commitment to gender balance. And the second one had to do with seeing other people who looked like them at levels above them in their organization. Back to Becky's, if you can see it, you can be it. The Issues around the lack of poor leadership commitment can lead to a compounding barrier of a lack of sponsor and advocates because men who are making those decisions don't necessarily understand the gap that occurs with women in their organizations and therefore may not necessarily step up and choose to act as a sponsor or advocate on behalf of women in their organization. Poor hiring practices can also lead to a very significant earnings and wealth disparity that again continues throughout a, a woman's career compared to her male counterparts. As previously mentioned, lack of stretch assignments can be a challenge. And some of that was associated in the studies we found with the, the fact that there is sex stereotyping for traditional roles. So women were seen as more likely to be successful in areas such as finance, human resources, in some cases, IT, which is great because women in tech have, have made great progress and, and are the clear sign that we can do the same sort of thing, and, um, and the legal area, which was mentioned previously. Because of that, the stretch assignments did not necessarily also include opportunities to lead operational organizations. And this becomes incredibly important because it leads to potentially the big gap that we see at the very top levels associated with senior officers leading operational organizations such as flight operations and technical operations and airport operations. And then the significant lack that Becky mentioned with regard to women in serving in CEO roles. 
Now, this, this gap between women being selected for the same sort of stretch roles that their male counterparts can be attributed to and was in a number of the studies to a, legit, a perceived legitimacy gap. The lack of women to be able to perform in these highly challenging and demanding roles, as well as their lack of technical knowledge and, and information. And we know that from all the examples that we see both on the board and, and women we interact with on a regular basis in our industry, that that's just simply not true. Now, what this all leads to and what you see here represented in the model by the infographics at each step is this workforce exodus. Studies cited that men left the industry because they were pulled to other opportunities where women were left the industry, the aviation industry, because they felt pushed out because of all the challenges they experienced throughout their career. Now, before we go to the next slide, I'm gonna hand off to Crystal, who's gonna talk about how we're gonna solve this problem. Thank you for that, Bobby. Um, I'm gonna start on this side of the timeline model and tell a story um, about a young girl who's proceeding um, on this, on the timeline model that Bobby just described. This young girl has a natural love for airplanes. Uh, when she looks up at the sky, she points uh, to all the planes overhead. She looks for airplane toys and books about planes, but she only sees pictures of boys and can't find any toys on the shelf uh, that, that she's attracted to. She tells her teacher at school she wants to be a pilot, but the teacher doesn't really know how to direct her. And she's never seen a female pilot herself, so she encourages her to consider dreaming to be something else. She flies every summer to visit her grandparents, but doesn't see anyone who looks like her flying the plane. In middle school, she decides to opt out of STEM curriculum because she was the only girl in the class. And she misses several opportunities to learn about careers in aviation. When she gets a little older, she looks for ways to become a pilot online. Um, she digs around on the internet, but she doesn't really know where to look and her parents don't know either. So she, you know, she ultimately stops looking. One day she just comes across an aviation college where she can go get her flight, flight training. And so she takes out uh, several student loans so she can go to college and do her flight training because her parents can't necessarily afford it and they aren't really supportive of her choice to become a pilot anyway. She's the only woman in her pilot classes and she's bullied and harassed by her classmates. She feels really isolated and like she has no one to talk to because she doesn't see anyone else in a leadership position that looks like her. But she continues flying because she loves flying and she sticks with it. When she finally gets her dream job of, of being an airline pilot, she's issued a, a uniform and new hire training that is ill-fitting and not designed for her. Her company policies and company manuals all, all refer to pilots as he and him. When she decides to have a family one day and becomes pregnant, she has to violate the company uniform policy because her company does not have a maternity uniform for her. When she finally has a baby, she's not given paid maternity leave to care for her child. So she has to return to work sooner than she'd like and has to decide between providing for her family and caring for her newborn. Her schedule is not flexible enough to continue breastfeeding her child and there are no accommodations for her to do it anyway. So she ultimately has to give that up too. She struggles to find childcare while she's away on trips and finds that she really has two jobs, managing her home and family and being an airline pilot. She feels overwhelmed and alone because there's no one in leadership who looks like her and understands what she's going through. So she ultimately decides to quit flying and give up all of her years of hard work because it's just too hard. So you can see on the barriers timeline as you go up the ladder on, um, in, in this part of the timeline, how there are women, as you continue to go up, there are women who start to fade off of the timeline. So this is the story of that woman who finally, at that rung on the ladder, she finally decides to exit the industry because it's not one that was designed for her. 
The barriers timeline model that Bobby just discussed, it can paint a pretty bleak picture. And like the story of the woman that I just spoke of, when you see the complex system of barriers that exist for women in aviation, it's easy to understand why the representation of women in our industry has remained stagnant for the past several decades. However, just as we have identified how barriers compound over time and ultimately cause women to either not choose aviation as a career or worse, leave the industry entirely, we have also identified certain leverage points that you can see along the timeline of a woman's career where strategic interventions can have a positive, sustained impact on the attraction, retention, and advancement of women in aviation. Next slide, please. The flight plan for the future side of, this, of the timeline model depicts key leverage points or opportunities to redesign the system that Bobby spoke of earlier. Throughout a woman's career, where external influences can significantly impact her career trajectory. The board's recommendations have been placed along the timeline at these key points and incorporate an overarching theme of systematic and cultural change. However, just as the barriers model is not an exhaustive list of all of the barriers that women can face in aviation, our recommendations do not encompass everything that can be done to accelerate the success of women in aviation. Instead, these recommendations represent a good place to start and are fundamental and essential to creating and sustaining the cultural shift needed to attract, retain, and advance women in our industry. You can also see in the model the number of women increasing as you progress along the timeline or up the ladder. This represents the momentum that is created when women can see themselves in different roles in aviation like several before me have talked about. As culture begins to shift toward being inclusive of women, more women will enter aviation, remain in the industry, and rise into leadership roles. Over time, this effect will lead to the sustained success of women in aviation. Given the workforce demand that several have spoken of that the aviation industry faces post-pandemic, there has never been a better, more critical time to rethink the systems in place for women. Our industry needs to recruit top talent and we need to do it now. The flight plan for the future is the how-to guide for tapping into 50% of the population or women that will be crucial to, again, the sustainability, profitability, safety, and innovative success of our industry that several have spoken of before me. I'd like to speak a moment about the culture shift in aviation that must occur. Culture change starts with leadership. Just like the captain sets the tone for her crew on a flight, industry and government leaders must set the tone to promote inclusive cultures inside their organizations. As the flight plan for the future model suggests, things like inclusive uniforms and appearance standards, inclusive policies and language, as well as having zero tolerance for incidents of bullying, harassment, and discrimination are needed to create a sense of belonging for all in aviation. Entities should be intentional about outreach and marketing strategies and materials so everyone has the potential to see themselves in an aviation career. Such things as family-friendly policies and flexible work schedules will allow people to thrive in their careers while having a family too and mentoring programs along with a focus on sponsorship and leadership development will help elevate women into key leadership positions so that they can impact decision-making needed for cultural change. Aviation leaders must commit to culture change by setting public goals and reporting out on progress. Bold leadership is essential to achieving the accelerated success that is depicted in the model. Now I'm gonna tell you a story about another young woman. When she's a toddler, her parents read her books that depict women as pilots, aircraft technicians, and air traffic controllers. She even has a pink toy airplane. When she travels on a plane to see her grandparents, airline safety videos feature a lady pilot and technician. She's even lucky enough to have a lady pilot fly her to see her grandmother a few times. At school, her guidance counselors and teachers provide her information on career paths 
and scholarship opportunities when she asks about careers in aviation. And they are able to direct her parents to a website that is a one-stop shop for aviation resources. She's able to find a local women in aviation chapter where she connects with a mentor and attends an aviation camp where she builds confidence through aviation activities. She sees aviation as a challenging and rewarding career that provides lots of opportunities to travel and see the world. She and her friends follow girls in aviation on social media. Her friends think aviation is also cool. She decides to go to flight school and receives several scholarships to help her pay for it. There are several women in her flight classes and even the school's chief pilot is a woman. So she feels like anything is possible. Her male peers cheer for her as she gets her flight ratings and they speak up for her if she's bullied. When she gets hired at the airlines, her uniform fits her perfectly and she feels like a million bucks when she wears it. She doesn't think about things like being referred to as him in her company policies and work rules because all of the language used includes her. When she, gets, when she decides to have a family and gets pregnant, she gets a care package from her company along with a link to order her maternity uniform. She's given enough paid time off after she has her baby so that she's able to recover from childbirth and care for her newborn. When she comes back to work, she has a flexible work schedule options and access to childcare resources. She becomes a chief pilot herself and then later represents her fellow pilots at the contract negotiating table and later as a senior vice president of flight operations. She advocates for and inspires others to pursue leadership roles. She feels supported and included and is able to serve her airline until she retires at age 65. There's no one person or entity responsible for enacting change. It will take us all, industry, government, nonprofits, and individuals working together to break down all of the barriers that exist for women today. We all need to do our part where and when appropriate to enact the board's recommendations so that meaningful change can be made. So that our first young lady story becomes a thing of the past and we hear only success stories like the second woman from now on. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Wilson. We are running a little bit ahead of time. So why don't we go ahead and uh, uh, Trish Gilbert, why don't you take it on and talk about our vision? Absolutely. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Crystal, for that amazing um, story, both stories. And um, it very motivating for me and I think for the rest of the board. And I hope the people that are watching really can relate to that. And, and I know many women do. But um, as pre we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, in our report, we uh, cover 50, we cover the five areas, culture, recruitment, retention, advancement, and data in 55 recommendations. These opportunities for in, in information are important to uh, this board and we hope important to the industry. In addition to these recommendations specific to culture change, the importance of culture underlies most, if not all, of the board's rec recommendation in the other areas, recruitment, retention, advancement, and data. As said previously, without broad and deep commitment to culture change, more tactical initiatives are unlikely to be fully effective. Changing culture is a long-term commitment, and as Crystal so eloquently made her point, no single entity or individual is responsible for it. It is about all of us moving in the same direction. The absence of broad senior leadership commitment and a transparent public effort to achieve real culture change towards gender inclusivity cements the status quo and actively discourages progress. So we'll continue to see uh, stagnant numbers. Just as the impact of many of the barriers extend beyond when women first experience them, many of the recommendations positively impact more than one phase of a woman's journey. The benefits of many of the recruitment recommendations also extend to retention and advancement. And for this reason, aside from culture, recruitment contains in the report the most significant number of recommendations. Further, some of the recommendations are not specific to women. However, these recommendations improve the representation of women in aviation by improving the recruitment of all talent. So our report is very important to us. Our recommendations are very thorough and have had a lot of work put into them. 
Now, what's next? A call to action. And how do we implement these very, very important recommendations? And if we can, I guess we'll go ahead um, and go to Renee for our call to action. Rich, thank you so much um, for all of your and Lauren's work in pulling together this report in its current form. Thank you, Administrator Dixon and Angela for your support of this work. And Dr. Wilson, you've been amazing at keeping us on track with the goal in mind. I've been honored to serve with each one of you. And I don't know if anyone else teared up a little bit as Crystal was describing those stories and what's at stake here, but but I certainly did. Crystal, thank you for sharing that. You mentioned that no one entity will be able to move us toward a different future. We've tried throughout our work not to point fingers, but to point a way to a richer future. And we took this task very seriously. While Congress assigned us the job of making recommendations to Congress and to the FAA, we took a few liberties to address a broader group, not just the role that government plays. Therefore, our recommendations are addressed to a number of parties, including each individual person in the industry, whether they're an employee, an educator, an historian, a volunteer, or a retiree. We all have a role to play. We have made recommendations to Congress, to the Federal Aviation Administration, the Department of Transportation, and other agencies at the federal, state, and local level to remove some of the barriers to entry and retention in the industry. As we discovered, workplace and industry culture underscore or amplify almost all of the barriers. Therefore, we strongly believe companies, nonprofits, educational institutions, trade associations, and labor unions hold the keys to substantial change in this industry. As you might expect, some of these recommendations are costly. However, based on the growing workforce needs in aviation and aerospace that Dr. Wilson mentioned earlier, we're faced with a choice. We can choose to pay the bill or we can choose to pay the price. That price, as Administrator Dixon stated, is ultimately safety. But there's also significant evidence that the negative impact of groupthink costs profitability, innovation, and sustainability. Because other industries with skilled labor are becoming more competitive, aviation is losing workers to those industries. And research shows that trend will escalate in future generations. Each one of us in our respective roles must address the gaps in order to keep the United States at the forefront of aviation and aerospace industries. The board's recommendations require sustained focus across current and future administrations and coordination among many organizations. Could you advance to the next slide, please? For the purposes of this presentation, we've created a legend to denote the primary addressee of each recommendation so that you can see the broad responsibility for change across the culture, recruitment, retention, advancement, and data recommendations. The change we are seeking requires engaging the appropriate organizations and professionals to prioritize and implement the recommendations in this report. While today we have a brief amount of time to go over these, the report is fairly comprehensive in its description of these recommendations. So when that's available after this meeting, I would highly recommend everyone reading the report in its entirety. These recommendations, as I mentioned, are addressed to Congress, the Department of Transportation, the Federal Aviation Administration and industry. Some require collaboration across several of these categories and are noted as combined recommendations. And with that, I know you've all been waiting to hear what we've recommended. And I'd like to turn this 
<clears throat> over to Amy Spauer to address the first category of recommendations. Good to go, Dr. Wilson. Good to go. Good to go. Thank you, Renee. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful for this board. I'm so thankful for this community of support. And I'm really excited to share with you a high level overview of our recommendations that specifically um, address workplace culture. And by high level, I mean to truly understand these recommendations. As Renee just shared, please read our report. As you've heard, while not intentional, the current culture works against women. Women as a, have always been allowed in aviation if they fit themselves into the system that's already in place. The culture change that is needed is a long-term intentional commitment that requires thorough action, which is transparent and public, and this change must begin from the top down. The following recommendations address the fundamental point that now is the time for a change that is inclusive, supportive, and welcoming to all, regardless of gender. Recommend, recommendations one, two, and three seek to build awareness of nonprofits that provide exposure and create pathways to opportunities for women seeking entry into aviation. The board also recommends an annual recognition summit that includes the celebration of people and organizations that drive meaningful change by advancing an inclusive culture. Recommendations four, five, and six serve to broaden awareness of opportunities for females across dedicated networks and have fair visual and verbal representation throughout all print and digital media. The board applauds the FAA's efforts to address terminology used in aviation and encourages this attention to continue. Recommendation number seven encourages the FAA to address personal appearance standards, which is a powerful external manifestation of culture. Women must have uniforms that are made for them, not only because it's appropriate, but because it also enhances safety. Recommendation number eight recommends that culture change is addressed from the very top down and that these changes are published, deployed, and measured. When leaders commit to change, they create a culture that is welcoming of employees' authentic selves. Recommendations nine, 10, 11, and 12 address safety, a paramount function of aviation. These include additions to the existing safety management system, an accessible safe reporting system for gender bias, discrimination, and sexual harassment, public dissemination of accurate medical exam requirements and reporting procedures and the guaranteed investigation of inappropriate exams and employee provided mental health services. The board makes these recommendations because explicit and implicit gender discrimination can directly and negatively impact aviation safety. Finally, recommendation 14 provides a mechanism for long-term accountability and continued advice to the FAA and the Department of Transportation regarding lasting and ongoing culture change. To provide sustained and ongoing focus, the Women in Aviation Advisory Board strongly recommends that Congress establish a permanent advisory committee on women in aviation. Thank you very much. Dana? Thank you, Amy. Dana, this is Heather. Why don't we go through your piece and then we'll we'll plan to stop there and take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and finish up. Great, thank you very much. All right, the recruitment recommendations were compiled through a series of focus groups. We would like to thank Georgia, North Dakota, Wisconsin, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina for contributing to our research. To address the barriers to the recruitment of women through aviation, 
Early exposure to aviation and aerospace, ongoing engagement, and financial support are all key. To attract more women, aviation needs to be visible, accessible, and an affordable option, which offers a sense of belonging for women when they join. The following two slides provide a listing of recommendations specifically geared towards the recruitment and education of girls and women. It is apparent that early exposure to aviation and ongoing engagement are essential to the recruitment of women into the industry. If I can call your attention to the slide for a moment, you will see that there are three recommendations specifically directed to the FAA's presence on the web, including a virtual resource center, social media, and curriculum development. The virtual resource center recommendation number 15 has been well developed within the report, including an easy to interpret graphic. The virtual resource center includes all the features of a one-stop shop for those interested in aviation, such as students, educators, schools, professionals, and industry representatives to find ways to engage educational pathways, mentorship opportunities, and communities of support. The board feels strongly the FAA is on the right track with the social media activities, and the report expands the idea of a virtual outreach in recommendation number 16 by outlining several enhancements, including the development of an influencer network that would serve to draw girls and young women towards awareness of an interest in aviation careers. The final recommendation directed specifically to the FAA on this slide is recommendation number 18, which tasks the FAA with development of curriculum geared for students as early as kindergarten. By developing and housing a curriculum repository on the website, the FAA can ensure through modern instructional technologies and updated content that women and girls are adequately represented in all aspects of the training material. The other recommendations on this slide require collaboration among a variety of agencies whether it be the FAA, Department of Transportation, Department of Education, or industry. Train the workforce trainers, describe a program with the purpose of informing the educators themselves about aviation opportunities for women, and is included as recommendation number 17. Recommendation number 19, high school post-secondary pathways, would provide avenues for secondary and post-secondary institutions to develop, develop and maintain partnerships between high schools and colleges leading to FAA certification and or aviation related certificates and degree programs. Another recommendation for the DOT is number 22, which is a description of immersive aviation confidence camps developed primarily for girls. These camps would include experiences like simulating air traffic control or aircraft flying, maintaining aircraft and performing various other operational tasks. Recommendation number 21 is a call to industry for volunteer role, role models. Industry should support learning and outreach efforts by advocating for aviation professionals to present at school and other organizations. Recommendation number 23 is also directed at industry to develop, to develop more internship programs and field experiences at local aviation facilities. The Department of Transportation is tasked in recommendation number 24 to either directly or through partnerships and grants, create a recruitment office at uh, local airports um, for age appropriate awareness and outreach for schools, camps, and career organizations. And in the interest of time, I will mention recommendation number 20, 25, and 26, which are similar in that they speak to the collaboration needed to ensure that federal funding sources connected properly to aviation education, both at the secondary and post-secondary levels. The FAA and the DOT should establish career readiness partnerships with other federal entities, including but not limited to the Department of Education, Department of Workforce Development, the Department of Labor. In addition, Congress should require the Department of Labor and the Department of Education to include aviation jobs that require federal certification, such as airline pilot and aviation maintenance on the high demand occupation list and the state industry certification list nationwide which would allow greater access to both state and federal workforce investment dollars for students pursuing these programs. I'll pass it off to you, Heather. Thank you so much. We're running ahead of schedule, but let's take a 10 minute break here um, and we will, uh, we will rejoin at half past the hour. So we'll see you back in about 10 minutes. Recharge your coffee cups and we'll continue. Welcome back. Um, we will reconvene the meeting and continue on address in the second part of addressing retention and re recruitment, um, which will be uh, presented by Suzanne Markle.
Okay, thank you, Heather. As soon as we get the slide up, I will... Can you all see the slide? There we are. I believe we need to go to 21. And I believe we need to go one more. All right. So pick up uh, here from the recommendations list that Dana Donati began. Uh, Dana, I appreciate you uh, uh, handling the first portion of those slides. As I continue describing recruiting initiatives, which would increase the number of women in aviation careers, I think that will be a, uh, become apparent uh, to those who are listening, as it has to us, that each of these items is quite a heavy lift, uh, particularly, particularly in the need for collaboration among agencies when we're getting into education specifically. Uh, with that being said, I'll take you through a brief synopsis of the remaining recruitment recommendations. Uh, uh, Dana had already uh, mentioned recommendation number 26 in her overview, so I'll move along to recommendation 27 which is transition from military to aviation opportunities. The FAA should actively market opportunities for women and men in military roles to enter the civil aviation industry after leaving military service and to remove barriers to enable an easier transition. Several of the recommendations on this slide address the financial barriers women encounter as they pursue post-secondary education opportunities. Recommendation 28, calls for the expansion of federal financial aid for these programs. Recommendation 29 is to establish a competitive federal grant program for state supported minority serving institutions to expand or establish aviation related programs. Federal financial support to colleges and universities that serve underrepresented communities will help reach a more diverse population of students, including women. The FAA Workforce Development Grant Program listed as Recommendation 30 is already an existing program. The FAA should expand eligibility for this grant program to require one or more organizations selected for the grant to have a focus on recruiting women or training women re-entering the workforce. Grant funding for female faculty and staff, Recommendation 31, is directed toward Congress. Federal grant funding should be allocated for workforce investment, uh, workforce development to support recruitment and mentoring programs at colleges and universities and career focused training programs. With the current pilot shortage, it is a frustration for women and men using GI Bill benefits to discover that the funds provided will not cover their educational costs. Recommendation 32 is a call for Congress to restore and expand the ability of American veterans to access funding through the GI Bill for a private pilot certification at Part 141 flight schools and additional funding toward commercial pilot certificates. Recommendation 33, the FAA and the Department of Transportation should partner with the aviation industry, the US military and universities to establish a high school cadet program for young women to complete their private pilot certificates the summer before their senior year. Number 34 recommends that the FAA provide a free virtual platform or template for industry, a scholarship program toolkit that includes all the resources for creating a company sponsored scholarship program. And finally, recommendation 35 describes the value of a mentoring app specifically for the aviation industry. One-time events such as school visits or weekend camps are useful, but effort is needed to maintain these connections over time. For industry representatives listening today, we invite you to explore the details contained in our report for some additional strategies on the development and administration of a successful mentoring app. The challenge of pulling all of our relevant national resources together whether it be Congress, federal agencies, industry associations, or private companies, for the purpose of recruiting women into the aviation industry will require substantial coordination over an ongoing 
period of time. Uh, if the FAA is to act as the hub for these initiatives, the Women in Aviation Board believes that the call for a permanent advisory committee is again reinforced here, as are the recommendations for the continued collection of data, which will be addressed later in today's meeting. Next slide. At this point, we're moving on to the retention and advancement of women in aviation presented by Jean Leiden Rogers. Jean? Thank you. Jean, just one. Uh... Just one pause for a second. We're running fairly far ahead of schedule, which is great, which will give us plenty of time to discuss once we get through the, the presentation itself. Um, I'm gonna ask for those who have not had a part in presenting one of the slides to think about if there's something you wanna say or add particularly so that, uh, that all of our, and, and then we'll go to other members as well as time permits. Jean, over to you. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Suzanne. Equally important are the board's recommendations for retention and advancement. To put that in context, I'd like to share a quick story. Last week, I met with a colleague who reminded me of the day he brought his daughter Marley to work back in 2014, when she was just eight years old, and I had the good fortune to meet with her in my office. Today, Marley is 16 and preparing for the college application process. Her father tells me that she wants to pursue a career in the aerospace industry and that her visit to our facilities that day played a role in shaping her vision. I was pleased and honored to hear that. Fortunately for our industry, Marley is on a path to be recruited. Now we need to ensure that the Marleys of the world are then retained and in due course given advancement opportunities. But as women progress through their careers, several barriers exist as we've discussed that can hamper these opportunities that are specific to work-life balance, family responsibilities, and issues unique to women in the workforce. Organizations should adopt policies and processes to address these elements and enable women to be successful in the workplace in order to achieve the vision that Crystal so eloquently described for that second young lady earlier in this presentation. Recommendations number 46 through 41 address these concerns. In summary, recommendation number 36 and 37 call for industry to provide paid leave associated with welcoming a new child to the family, as well as caring for ill family members, and that this should be a priority for industry, as well as any labor unions representing their employees. Recommendations number 38 through 40 address work-life balance considerations. Industry is asked to provide flexible scheduling options and childcare resources with solutions ranging from daycare placement to childcare reimbursement. There is also a call for the FAA to fund research on human factors, safety and physical health for nursing mothers while on flying duty. Recommendation 41 focuses on the need for Congress to ensure that legislation intended to support women or other underrepresented groups also applies to the aviation industry and that the Department of Transportation ensure that all regulations, orders, and guidelines cover the aviation workforce as well. The next two recommendations pertain to mentoring. Mentoring is critical to the retention and advancement of women. Mentors can provide the essential navigational support to address the compounding barriers that we have discussed and can help with driving a non-exclusionary culture in which everyone feels a sense of belonging, thus improving the development, retention, and advancement of women. Recommendation 42 calls for industry to implement mentoring programs in which mentors are trained on mentoring skills as well as professional development, and where mentors are thoughtfully matched with mentees. Specific to an area where the gender gap is greatest is recommendation 43 regarding pilots. The FAA should enhance relevant advisory circulars to address mentoring programs for new hire and second in command airline transport pilots, as well as initial upgrading captains. And on to the last four recommendations, 
specific to advancement. The Barriers Timeline model shows that mid-career women experience a lack of leadership development opportunities to position them for advancement. Women are more likely to be overlooked for stretch assignments and promotions. Men are more likely to have sponsors advocate for them when they are not in the room. And this is a known recipe for success when it comes to advancement. Very few women are given the opportunity to lead P&L organizations. And the data shows that women rarely serve as the CEO of airlines or aviation companies. Professional development efforts are needed to address the specific challenges women may face navigating a male-dominated industry. The board puts forth these four recommendations to facilitate the advancement of women. Recommendation 44 requests the FAA to provide resources to industry with documented professional development programs. And Recommendation 45 calls for industry to create such programs using these resources. Number 46 is a recommendation for industry to develop communities of support or affinity groups, if you will, within their organizations for peer and leadership guidance in navigating critical skills and confidence factors needed for advancement. And finally, recommendation number 47 on sponsorship. Industry leaders should adopt personal plans to sponsor one or more women, advocating for them and providing visibility so that others can recognize their capabilities and potential advancement when they're not in the room. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Mary Ann DeMarco to discuss data recommendations. Thank you, Jean. In this section, data recommendations, as an overview, the board identified gaps in data across occupations, entities, as well as diversity. From a 30,000 foot view, the significant benefits of data collection, analytics, and, and continuing research include timely responses to current and future workforce demands. The collection of data also improves future planning and strategically aligned decision making by U.S. companies, agencies, and more specifically, the aviation industry. The data components provide definitive and comprehensive industry trend reporting, metrics, and drivers relevant to the aviation industry. There are significant gaps to effectively report on industry trends and monitor data necessary for strategic preparedness for women in aviation and the workforce of the future. I'd like to highlight some of the data recommendations in our report. Recommendation number 48, expand FAUS civil airman statistics. This recommendation is to expand the publicly available FAA active US civil airman statistics annual study to include gender data for all civil airmen certificate categories tables and include historical data to the earliest year of record keeping. Additional guidance is included in this recommendation. Industry annual public reporting and tracking of data recommendation number 49. Industry should adopt best practices of tracking and publicly reporting the number of women in aviation occupations and leadership positions to include race, ethnicity, and occupation level to better identify the number of women employed and in leadership positions. As an example, annual diversity reports. The next recommendation, recommendation number 50, Department of Transportation annual report on workforce data and pay parity. This recommendation requires all aviation industry organizations to provide to the Department of Transportation with annual for workforce data, including gender, race, ethnicity, occupation and level, and pay by gender, which would which would then be provided to annually to Congress and the public. Recommendation number 51, Department of Transportation reporting requirements. Most US passenger and cargo airlines, whether publicly traded or privately owned, report financial and operating information to the DOT on a monthly, quarterly, or semi-annual basis. The reporting requirements should also include information on workforce, and workforce diversity data to include pay by gender. Recommendation number 52, Transportation Research Board report. For this recommendation, Congress should require the Transportation Research Board, 
better known as TRB, to provide an annual report on women in transportation across all sectors of aviation, including but not limited to airlines, airports, transportation security, manufacturing, and engineering. Recommendation number 53, Department of Labor data collection. Congress should require the DOL to include all sectors of the workforce in reporting for women. This would be obtained through the census data that is currently collected by expanding data collection on women in all sectors of aviation occupations to include engineers, architects, planners that work on aviation airspace projects such as infrastructure, airports, and aviation facilities, airport managers, airport operations, and maintenance personnel, as well as aviation unions leadership and member groups. Recommendation number 54, call for further research, recommends that the FAA should competitively award grant funding for continued research on the recruitment, retention, and advancement of women in aviation, including but not limited to the evaluation of implemented recommendations from this report. And finally, recommendation number 55, the FAA report to Congress. Congress should require an annual report from the FAA providing relevant data and progress on initiatives undertaken to implement the recommendations of this report and research done to evaluate the effectiveness of these recommendations. These data recommendations contained in our report are crucial and support all of the recommendations provided in our presentation today. As we all know, Data, provide, data drives policy, and in order to continue to affect much needed change, our industry requires significant data collection and reporting across all sectors and career paths. All agencies, including the FAA, DOT, Department of Labor, as well as the NTSB, DHS, TSA, and the TRB and industry must all work together to accurately report on workforce data, women in aviation, diversity issues, and the recent changing dynamics of women in the workforce as a re result of the pandemic. These important efforts will help close the loop in significant data gaps and prepare the U.S. for the recruitment, retention, advancement, funding, and awareness, as well as opportunities in the multiple pathways for our aviation industry's current workforce and the next generation of women in aviation professionals. So in closing, thank you very much for the opportunity um, and I'll now head it over to Heather, back to you. Thank you, Marianne. In the interest of making sure we have a complete record of this meeting, I'd like to go through the slides and the appendices. If you would go to the next slide, please. One of the things that's important is for the public to understand just how exceptional this group of 30 men, women are. And as you've heard from the previous presentations, there's some, some pretty deep thought that's gone into this. This is the first half of our board members. Next slide, please. And the remaining complement of the 30 people who put together this report and did this work. Next slide, please. One of the things that uh, became clear as we did our work was that there were different recommendations for different particular audiences. We have also in the report and in an appendix identified which recommendations are for which audience so that people who read the report can find the things that apply to them. These are the recommendations for Congress. Next slide, please. These are the recommendations for the Department of Transportation as a whole. Next slide, please. These are the recommendations for the FAA. Next slide, please. And these are the recommendations for industry. Next slide, please. We also have some recommendations that are to more than one entity or where there's responsibility, um, responsibility is shared. And these are combined recommendations. And I believe that is the last slide. If you could take down the presentation. What I'd like to do now is we had, uh, we had about 17 people involved in, in, uh, in uh, this presentation and I wanna commend all of you. Um, it was, that was an exceptional um, presentation and piece of work. What I'd like to do is to open it up initially for comments, questions or crosstalk 
Um, starting out with those who didn't have, have a role in presenting one of the slides. So we have about 12 of our members who haven't yet participated today. And if, and if, if you'd like to use that you know, raise hand function, I will try to see it. And if I, if I don't see it, somebody will surely help me and point it out. And we will um, uh, take comments from uh, starting out from those who didn't have a chance uh, to help present the, the, um, the report today. Looking for hands. Okay, are there comments from anyone who did have a, an opportunity to help present the report, but wants to add something else? Heather, I think, think Stacy and Candace have their hands raised. Really? Okay, I'm gonna need help here because I don't see that on my machine. Um, Stacy, why don't you start out? Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I just wanted to take a really brief moment and point out a recommendation in regards to uniforms, just from a purely SMS standpoint, especially within the maintenance community, uniforms that fit and PPE that fits are a very big safety concern. As we're maneuvering around aircraft and in confined spaces, if we don't have a uniform well suited to our body and PPE designed for women, it creates a very real safety concern. Thank you, Stacy. Um, Candace, do you have a comment or a question? Just a brief comment, Heather. Thank you. I wanted to um, thank you and all the team who worked so very hard on this. Um, what struck me was the brilliance of the chart, uh, the the diagram talking about the barriers and then what the future is. So I think as we all talk to our colleagues and portray that out in the industries, various industries in which we're involved, that's such a nice summation of what what's going on here. But I would really like to our, encourage our friends at FAA and within Congress to establish this as a permanent committee or establish some sort of permanent committee around it, because we all know um, it's the reporting and the transparency and the visibility that's really going to keep this issue at the forefront. So just a, a personal note on my part. Thank you, Candace. I'm seeing some more hands on the little thing here. I, I just have to look in the right place. Allison. Thank you. Um, I'd like to piggyback on that. And um, Dr. Ludi always says what gets measured gets done. And if we don't continue with a permanent board, someone that an organization like that, that is constantly looking at and measuring results, um, I think that we won't be as successful with implementing change. Thank you, Allison. I saw a hand and it just disappeared on me. Heather, that was Korea short. Uh, I was going to add an- Hi, thank you, Karen. Thank you. I was gonna underscore Candace's comment um, about how impactful uh, not only the graphics are, but I also think as we listened this morning, as we've listened in prior meetings uh, to the public stories. And so if there's any way, I know we have a number of uh, initiatives where we're going to share this information via town halls and other, uh, but I think if we can capture those stories, uh, the data is absolutely important for the foundation of the, of the reason why the stories create that emotional tie that binds. And I think that that's an important aspect that uh, any way that we can convey that to, to, to Congress, the FAA or other would be important. Yeah, thank you. Is there any of the other members who did not have a chance to speak this morning? Bobby, uh, I see Bobby's, I thought I saw Bobby's hand come up, but uh, if there are, are there any others who haven't had a chance to speak yet this morning who'd like to, to weigh in? How about those who did have a chance to speak, but who um, want to add something more? So let's just open it up. Bobby Wells. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Heather. So uh, one thing I, I'm not sure we hit on that I, I think as, as I'm listening to the comments here at the end is really foundational. And may, maybe it's self-evident, but I do think it's necessary to, to mention this. 
I, the, the cementing element beyond being able to measure the things that they talk so well about that are currently missing in our data and beyond the activities around coordinating all the change that needs to happen is we have to be really clear that in order for us to build sustained change, it's going to take not just weeks and months, but it's going to take many, many, many years. We, we heard that it's taken us decades to get to where we are. The same sort of resilience and patience for shifts has to be part of the communications to senior leadership because it's going to take that kind of intestinal um, fortitude and that bold leadership that we've talked about in the past in order for us to pursue the recommendations that were described by so many people on the board this morning. Great point. Others who would like to weigh in, just open, open it up to anyone. Hey, Heather, it's Amy. Um, something yeah. I, I wanted to point out, um, and Kate Gibo is in my head. I, I saw this on a LinkedIn post she did a while ago about there aren't jobs in aviation, there's careers in aviation. So I'm going to say this um, with all due respect, Kate, that um, the, you know, the FAA recognizes um, 53 jobs in aviation across eight career fields. And we have a, a really effective chart in the report that talks about all the different rules in aviation. So for folks out there that think that aviation is just pilots or just flying or just this, um, there's a lot of uh, aviation leaders on this in this board. There's a lot of pilots, but there's a lot of people like me who don't even know how to fly a plane. And I'd like to think that my role is effective and important in aviation, just as I think that, you know, whether it's academics or uh, mechanics or, or, you know, any of the other roles in aviation, I, like women can do tons of things in aviation. We can have lots of careers and um, lots of exciting backgrounds and it adds to the richness and the complexity that is this field. So I just wanted to, to point that out real quick that it, it's not just about flying, it, it's about a lot of things. Thank you, Amy, that's great. Trish Gilbert. Thank you, uh, Chairman Wilson, uh, Chairwoman Wilson. <laughs> um, I want to, as you um, put in your report, that now let's get to work. Um, I just would like to invite industry and government and, and all of those that, that really um, want to see these great recommendations get implemented to join us on social media, um, in venues where we will be talking about the report and the recommendations and trying to get these recommendations implemented. It's really gonna take those entities to join us in that effort. So I would ask that they really, really focus on that, take a leadership role and work with us. Great. Others who'd like to add in. Hello, Dr. The Wilson. Hands. Um, it's Tracy Miller. Uh, uh, someone said yeah, that Tracy. it's- Yeah, go ahead. It, it's going to take years for us to really into perpetuity. This, this will be something that will constantly need to be looked at and assessed and reassessed. And so as we're doing a call to action to help implement our recommendations, we can also right now, all of us, anyone from coast to coast, from the north to the south of our wonderful USA, take a moment to try to volunteer to get young kids involved. I mean, there is no sooner moment to start now. So whether you call your local or your state school systems, you engage with your higher ed or anyone that's doing training in aviation, you call the industry in your area that is doing anything with aviation. If there's any piece of you that would like to somehow engage and get young girls interested in this career. This is a moment that we can all touch a life and really help share this, this industry sector that we all love so much. And we will need to do it early and often and, uh, and forever. So uh, hopefully we've got a lot of folks watching this today and engaged on social media that will just take a moment and plug in if you've never volunteered before. Great point. Kelly Jost. Yeah, I just wanna piggyback on what Tracy said, that volunteering is so important and to have companies 
support their employees and allow them the time to do that sometimes during work hours would be really, really helpful. So call to action for companies, support your employees on those efforts. And, and if you don't already have a program in place, maybe put a program in place to allow a certain number of volunteer hours in a year. I think that would be really helpful. It's great. Looking for other hands. Renee, and after Renee, Kate. Thanks, Heather. I think that it's significant to note that what we've tried to do is create an opportunity here for everyone to win and for everyone to participate, whether they're industry or in a governmental role. And I think that it's very important to take the, the tone of our report, which is um, one that looks at the reality, but also is moving toward a positive future and note that instead of loading up industry with additional recommendations, we were, or with additional mandates or regulations, we were very proactive in looking for ways for industry to be the hero of our recommendations. So I hope that um, those who are in industry will note that and look at our intentions to not create um, an unusual amount of recommendations or sorry, regulations, but we'll note that they have an opportunity to do the right thing and to create a track of positive peer pressure in doing so. So I hope that that, that could be noted as well. Thank you, Renee, great point. Uh, Kate, Kate G. Thank you. The positive uh, peer pressure I think is um, really healthy and uh, something that uh, we're all competitors um, at heart. And so I think that that absolutely can move the dial. I also um, just wanted to uh, thank the FAA for uh, their, their efforts to change, um, changing the words that they're using because words do matter, uniforms matter. It's small things and big things all at the same time that are gonna make a big difference. So uh, that signaling by changing the words the uniforms, I couldn't agree more. Um, parental leave is something that I'm thinking about in my 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 role and how we could um, how we could come to a great solution on that. So, uh, but again, I just wanted to say thank you to the FAA for taking that step because it's really important. Also, a great point. Looking for anyone else who wants to comment or add something in. I'm not seeing any hands. Do this like an auction, going once, going twice. Okay, then what I would like to, uh, uh, we, the, the point that we're at with the report is it's gone back and forth uh, with the, the uh, graphics folks who've been very helpful in laying it out. We do have final checks going on, uh, footnotes. Um, so, so what I'm going to ask is that we, we, uh, uh, we're going to take a vote today on the report subject to technical and conforming changes, because we expect over the next few days that we will find little errors that we want to fix. And then we will submit the report as required in the statute when we're comfortable that we've, uh, that we've, we've uh, gone through it with our fine tooth combs and we, we think it's all correct and, um, and that we've spelled things correctly and so forth. I am not in charge of spelling, by the way. Um, so, so, uh, so that's where we are. So the motion today that I would entertain is a motion to approve the report subject to technical and conforming changes. Is there someone would like to make that motion? So move. Moved by Carrie Dixon. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Elise Aberwine, I believe. All those in favor, I'd like you to go ahead and push the, uh, the speak button so that uh, we can actually see here. Raise your hand on your, on your, um, on your uh, system.
believe I am seeing unanimous support for approval of the report. I would also note that one of our colleagues, um, uh, Tammy Jo Soltz is the only member who is not here today. Uh, thank you, you can put your, put your hands down. But the Tammy Jill Schultz is our only member of our board who is not here today. She had a conflict that she just couldn't resolve. She did ask me to note for the record that had she been here, she would have voted in favor of uh, the report as presented. Um, uh, so I believe we now have a unanimous recommendation of 30 uh, professionals for the content of this report and for it to be submitted to the FAA. You can all give yourselves a round of applause. Okay, let's see. Uh, Angela, is there any other business that we need to conduct? So just some words that I would like to say, Heather, to the board, you and the board. So what I would like to do is to thank you all for your hard work and dedication over this time of working in this environment. We are very thankful that the board maintained its commitment and focus here. I can't believe we're actually here. We all were hoping that we would at least have one public meeting in person, but unfortunately, you know, the pandemic did not allow that. So, you know, you all could have very easily not being as committed because everything was done virtually, but you all didn't do that. And so to me, what that speaks for is that you all's commitment to women in aviation, and you all wanted to actually broaden that and make sure everyone, girls and women, have access to aviation. So I did just want to say thank you for your hard work. I know it wasn't easy, and we really appreciate it. And so the other thing I just want to say and just trying to tie this up is that we all look forward to receiving the report and reading it. And just as a reminder, once the FAA and Congress receives the report per the statute, the Women in the Aviation Advisory Board will sunset and it would no longer exist. And so also we can't post it to our FAA committee website until we receive it and no Congress has received it. And then it will be open to the public. So I just wanna make sure um, everybody is reminded of that and to know that I will work with Heather to try it on a timeline purpose from a timeline perspective so that once FA has received it and Congress has received it, everybody knows that they can then push it out to who they want to push it out to. So again, thank you all for your time and your effort and your commitment. And we really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I expect that over the next week here, we'll be going through some final, um, final, final edits and fixes. Uh, then the report in its final form will come to me. I'll put cover letters on it and submit it to the FAA and to Congress. I will also make sure that everyone is, is uh, CC'd on that so you all know when the work is done and it's been submitted and you'll have a copy of the copy of the report as submitted for yourself and for your files. So thank you all very much. This has been a great group to work with. Um, I also regret that we didn't ever actually see each other in person although some of us did at some of the working sessions. Um, and uh, so my only final, final comment is if, you, if any of you end up in El Paso, Texas, the coffee pot is always on. With that, I think we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.